Hello, Hopkinton. My name is Tara Sando with eHop, and this is Know Your Vote 2020 Social Distancing Edition. Uh, this is the fourth of a four-part series where we'll be meeting with town officials to discuss the articles to be voted on at town meeting, which will be held on Saturday, September 12th, outdoors at the high school. Uh, if you have any questions about how town meeting will be run, uh, I just completed my interview with the town clerk and town moderator, so you can watch that video on HCAM as well. Joining us today via Zoom are Dr. Kavanaugh, Superintendent of Schools, Susan Brothmitch, Director of Finance, and Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the School Committee. So welcome and thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules to meet with us today. I can't even begin to imagine how busy you guys have been over the past couple of months. So we truly appreciate your time here. Uh, my intent is to make this interview as quick as possible uh, so that you can get back to the business of getting our students back up and running. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'm gonna jump right in with Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. Okay, so here we are 10 days before town meeting. Um, I've got a two part question to start off with and that's, um, has the select board and the appropri appropriations committee signed off on the budget? And is this the same budget that was initially signed off on in January? So yes, the select board and appropriations have signed off on the budget, budget but no, this is not the same budget that we had seen um, in January, specifically on the 16th. Um, so in January, both the select board and the school committee had approved the budget. It had not gotten to appropriations prior to the shutdown on March 10th. The budget that we had in January was 8.9% increase over FY20, and the one that we are looking at today is a 6.6 .6 increase over FY20. Okay. Um, so my next question is, um, in your presentation dated uh, May 28th, you shared a slide that is entitled uh, School Committee Budget Change After Economic Downturn. And there were five points on the slide, uh, which I think were the principles behind your approach to the renovated budget. Um, could you go through those five points of the focus on the classroom and maintaining instruction and so on? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And then Mrs. Rothermick can add in anything that I may have overlooked. Uh, so the five points are the first is a focus on the classroom. And what we meant by that is that when we were reducing the budget from the 8.9% increase to 6.6, we really wanted to move away from eliminating any of the classroom teachers that we had been requesting. Uh, we had quite a few classroom teachers that we were looking at and you know that we were asking for those because of the increases in enrollment in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So if we were to leave those positions in, the goal was really to be able to reduce our class size and to make sure that the instruction in our classrooms would be maximized. Um, the second was maintaining instructional quality. So in addition to class size, we wanted to make sure that we were able to provide for our kids the materials and the technology that they would need as well. Uh, when we were reducing our one-time purchases, so out of the FY20 budget, you know, if there was any surplus there as a result of, you know, the closure, uh, we were able to purchase those one-time things such as textbooks, you know, things that are kind of big ticket items, but then we wouldn't have to take that money out of the FY21 budget because we would have already purchased them in FY20. Uh, other funding resources tend to be our grants and um, with deferring our capital projects, which was the fifth uh, sort of tenant on, on that list, um, that was really a town-wide decision. I believe that you know every municipal entity uh, deferred all of their capital projects for this year. This is actually the smallest annual town meeting packet that I've ever seen. <laughs> so it should be a quick meeting. Um, it may also be the shortest school presentation. <laughs> I know all the controversy and drama is not included in this one. None. Um, so there is a reduction in a, the social emotional resources and a custodial reduction. Can you explain that um, to the reader of the budget? We just see like a, a line item reduction, um, but I know there's a lot of deliberation that goes into a cut like this. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. 
Sure. So in sort of protecting um, the, the classroom, uh, when we were looking at making those reductions, we tried to steer away from personnel. But because personnel really does make up the biggest part of your budget, you know, we thought, okay, there are going to have to be some places where personnel, you know, are eliminated. We had an ask on the table for a 1.0 social emotional learning FTE, and that 1.0 FTE would have been half time at Elmwood and half time at Marathon. Uh, because we were able to get our class sizes down and because we really do have you know, good guidance staffing and BCBAs in those buildings, what we decided to do was to eliminate a 0.5 position in existence at Elmwood, as well as the 0.5 ask there, as well as the 0.5 ask at Marathon. So it was a half existing whole ask that came out to 1.5 FTEs. I hope that that's making sense. So one of the half of the position already existed in the district and the whole position that we eliminated was one that we had asked for but didn't intend to fill. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay, uh, so, um, so beyond the budget, uh, which is what we're spending, you have received state funding and grants um, due to COVID. Can you briefly go over those? I know it doesn't affect what we're going over at town meeting, but it is just good information to have for the town. Sure, and maybe part of this piggybacks a little bit on um, the last question because we did eliminate three custodians from yes. the budget. Um, and they were three custodians that we had asked for. They weren't people who were already working in the district. Uh, so when we got the, the CARES Act money, there was $800,000 and you know, we use that as kind of an estimate. So the town got 1.6 million. We look at that as saying, well, you know, 800,000 might feasibly go to the public schools. Uh, with the coronavirus relief fund, we got $225 per student. And so that came to $866,000. And then there was 49,000 in the ESSER grant. And I can let Mrs. Rothenberg talk a little bit about what she, um, sees us doing with all of that money. I know ESSER is largely curriculum, but you could certainly talk more, Susan, about where we're spending money on PPE and personnel and all of that. Sure, so basically the, the bottom line for the CARES and the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is also CARES and ESSER is also CARES. So it, it all does fall under the same bucket. Um, it is to cover any expense that was not budgeted for. Um, so what we're running into is the need to hire additional custodians. That's something that was not budgeted. While it was asked for, this is a very different approach to how we um, are within our buildings. We're also looking at additional nursing staff. So those are, those are two of the personnel costs that we would look at for these grants but also moving to remote learning and really trying to preserve that students get a Hopkinton teacher. There's also an ask out there for additional teaching staff um, at the high school level. So those will all be charged in terms of personnel to the CARES funding, all three of those buckets, but it gives us the ability to be able to handle the teaching and learning of what needs to happen um, with this change in model, if you will, and again, non-budgeted. Then you get into the other expenses, such as PPE, which is masks, plexiglass, face shields, um, additional um, spray things to be able to clean, additional cleaning materials in general, mm -hmm. as well as classroom materials to eliminate the need to share materials. So it really covers uh, the full gamut of how you run a school, but looking at it from a very different lens in terms of where we are with this um, virus. Yeah, and I will add, you know, it's really important to get our kids back into the classroom because I think that they need face time with teachers and they need a little bit of socialization with one another. But as you look at those numbers, you can see just how enormously expensive it is to do that. Right. Now, I don't need an exact number, but do you know the percentage of students that chose remote learning as opposed to the hybrid? District-wide, we have about 25-26% who are fully remote, and the um, other 75-74% are um, coming in in the hybrid model. 
But what's interesting, I think, in the community might find this interesting, is that that differs from school to school. So at the Elmwood School, for example, 40% of the kiddos have, are, are, have chosen remote, for example, but at the high school, it's only 12%. So I wonder if oh, that wow. doesn't sort of translate, yes, to a, you know, in the second grade, parents feel like they kind of have a handle on the learning and they can guide their children through it more readily than, you know, a parent thinking I can teach my child BC Calc, for example, you know. Right. Yeah. Now, I know going into this budget season originally, there was a concern for the transportation cost. Is that still a concern or is that balanced out with the remote and hybrid combination? I will let Susan speak to that because <laughs> no one in the world has done more transportation work than Mrs. Rothermick this summer. <laughs> so the, the, the discussion that we always have with transportation uh, with any budget year is really tied to enrollment. So what we had done is added two additional buses in this budget year to be able to facilitate the enrollment increases that have happened. So that was something that was in the budget long before anything ever happened. Now what has changed is you, you have, um, to what Dr. Kavanaugh has just spoken to, 25% roughly have chosen to do full remote. So no matter whether they rode the bus or not, that takes a, a certain population out. Then another 25% of the remaining have chosen that they do not need transportation. Uh, and, and there's all these guidelines that have changed in terms of how many students you can put on a bus. So those, that reduction in numbers has really helped us to hit those guidelines in terms of keeping the numbers low on a bus. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of, you know, will we be adding buses? Will we be doing all these other things? We have no capacity to add buses. There aren't buses out there to add. So the fact that parents opted off transportation has been very beneficial to us if, from an operations standpoint because it has allowed us to bring those numbers down, keeping with the same number of buses. So it has not cost us um, any amount of money at, at this point in time. That's great. Yeah. Now in the same line of conversation, the new models of remote and hybrid, have there been additional um, technology cost in order to outfit the students with Chromebooks or laptops or uh, iPads I heard were being distributed as well? So, and, and again, uh, Mrs. Rodney, you can jump right in, but the Chromebooks and the iPads and so sort of, you know, the actual device itself, those are things that we would have purchased anyway for our kids you know given the number of devices we have k-12 to um, we were pretty much a one-to-one -one district when all of this started so that has not been really a cost for us but what has been are you know the the software and the applications that students are going to be using so we have you know screencastify for example we just upgraded to a more deluxe model uh, panopto which allows our teachers to make videos to be pushed out we have licenses for those for all of our teachers uh, Schoology, which is our new learning management system, so the kids in grades four to 12 kind of have one-stop shopping to navigate all of their coursework. Where are the videos? Where are the Zoom links? Where are the worksheets? Where is, you know, any of that stuff is all in one place. Where's the assessment? Module one, module two, it guides kids right through a course. So those are the things that we have spent the most money on as opposed to the devices. Okay. You just got me a little stressed out with all those different things, but <laughs> we're going to make it through this year. We're all going to figure it out together. <laughs> um, now, uh, for the past couple of years, there have been issues with enrollment or growing enrollment and, and outfitting, you know, our schools to handle all these students. Now that we have a lot of remote learners, is that kind of balancing out this year? Space-wise, it's, you know, working out in our favor, obviously, because we're only bringing in half of our kids every day, and roughly a quarter of our kids are not even coming into our building. So, you know, in terms of the physical plant, there's lots of space. One of the other things that we've been seeing, and I think um, Susan and I looked at this just before this broadcast, um, we had maybe 31 students leave us in the last couple of weeks, and those are the students who are leaving us for things like private schooling or homeschooling. 
you know, I, I think that there are families who are looking to private schools because they believe they won't shut down as readily as the public schools might, for example, or parents have just decided that homeschooling would be the best option for their family because that's what's going to work best. So I imagine that our students will return to us um, after the pandemic has been, you know, I guess there's, you know, a vaccine for the virus or things have been brought back under control. But for now, I think families are just looking at, you know, options. And you are providing this year flu shots, is that correct? Or that's, sorry, go ahead. No, th that's through the um, Department of Public Health. Okay. I heard from Sean and Casey Morrow that they're going to be doing some kind of flu shot clinic, but the information for that will come through them. And that would be outdoors at, at one of the schools? I think that that is the story, but I, I don't, you should fact check with them. I will. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I would like to just get an update from our last special town meeting. We've got um, a couple of big projects that were going on this summer through the pandemic um, at the high school, Elmwood and Hopkins. So just an update on those three projects. Um, that's really your department as well, Susan. So I'll let you speak to the construction projects because I know you monitor them closely. Okay, thank you. So the, mo the modulars will come down to the wire. Um, the the timing of the modulars would have fallen very well, but once um, any manufacturer had to follow to any type of COVID regulations, it lessened the amount of construction workers that could work within the modular units at the same time. So whereas you would typically flood that with plumbers, electrician, drywall, whatever flooring, all at the same time, you would see only one trade at a time was allowed to get in there. Um, so the modulars are a little bit behind. Delaying the opening of school has certainly worked in our favor, but the, those two projects will come down to the wire. They will be ready, um, but it, it will be, uh, we'll be getting our certificate of occupancy <laughs> at, at the Thank last you. minute. <laughs> yeah. uh, the high school is underway. It really is very newly underway. So there's no reason to believe there's any delays at this point in time. Um, the original thought was that we would be in by the Christmas break, but that has long passed. And the, the next thought is really um, uh, February vacation is what the high school is, is planning for. Okay. Yeah, and we have walked through the Elmwood and Hopkins modulars. They look really beautiful on the inside. So I think that, you know, they really are in an advanced stage of construction for sure. Absolutely. That'll be great. Yeah. yeah, and those will be used for classrooms, correct? Yes. So um, at Hopkins, we you know may have the Kids Grow program in there for full time care for teachers, um, and that that has just sort of evolved because of the number of students who are not in attendance this year at Hopkins. You know, certainly, if all of our students were back in, we would fill those modulars readily. Um, and one of the other things that we have found is so in small classrooms where you would have um, typically done, say, you know, a small pullout reading group or you've had counseling with, you know, the school psychologist or something like that, because we would have had maybe three of speech and language, for example, we would have had three or four or five kids in a small space. What we've done now is we've tried to relocate them to some of the larger classrooms. And so some of the teachers who are teaching students that are remote, we've moved some of those teachers into, you know, those smaller rooms that would have used, been used for small groups. So the students, um, certainly on IEPs, that usually get pulled from a classroom for those kind of services, are they still being pulled out of the classroom? Well, just to be clear, you know, the ideal model is to do a push-in, right, that we would like to be able to deliver all of our services in the classroom. But in, if, you know, in any student's IEP or, you know, a kid doesn't have an IEP but get re gets reading services or someone gets, you know, speech and language, th they would still be pulled out and there is ample room for that to happen. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next thing is the HCA Stabilization Fund or the, the host community agreement. Um, Will this, I know this is um, run through the town manager, so we'll be asking uh, him about this as well. Um, will any of that money be used this year in this budget? So our understanding right now is that the answer to that is no. 
um, originally we were planning on that. And I don't know, Susan, if you would like to talk any more about that, but at this point, you know, we think that it will just go into our stabilization fund and, and stay there. That's correct. So the funding model, once the pandemic hit and um, the economy really turned south, the funding model that the town was using, and, and again, I, this is really more of a discussion with the town manager and, and CFO, um, but they really were looking at how to best fund this budget uh, at a reduced level. And at the time, they were thinking with one of the assumptions, if the state revenues were down so low, they would pull from that HCA stabilization. The good news is it looks as though the funding from the state will not be as low as that original assumption. That being said, uh, the state has not passed a budget, um, but at this time they're moving forward with not using the HCA money, which is very good news. So it will stay in the stabilization uh, for the school department. Okay, great. Um, and I'm not sure who to uh, give this question to, but the high school diversity club uh, came up with a program that was supposed to be today and is being postponed. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, um, who's putting it on and um, how people can get involved. Sure, I would love to talk about that. So the, it's, it's been very interesting. Uh, the high school diversity club um, is, you know, a group that's really, you know, they've, they've, they've been kind of active within the school. And then there's another group in town called the Hopkinton Freedom Team. So as the Freedom Team was kind of in its infancy, we had reached out to some of the members of the diversity club, kids who had graduated from the high school, um, as well as some of the advisors. And somehow in that venue, we started to talk about a community wide event. So uh, Freya Proudman, who graduated in 2018, Shazane Khan, who is 2020, he just, re he just graduated this spring, and Mike Finn, Kim Hesse, and Lisa Winter, they are the three people who advise that. And then there's also Sam Breen, Dan Collins, so there's a, a good little core group of, of faculty at the high school. And Lisa Winter had uh, seen a, a Talk About It event, and that got... Freya, I think, really motivated. So she started to put together flyers. And then Kim Hesse contacted Representative Dykema and the police department and the town hall and the fire department and everybody. So the whole notion is that tomorrow afternoon, sometime between noon and four, anyone in the community should be able to go out and do any kind of chalk drawing that promotes diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, or what they call a bar anti-bias, anti-racist messaging just messages of kindness and empathy and love, whatever it is. Um, the school district has a few drones and so we'll be able to take photographs using our drones. Um, but if folks in town wanna to take pictures and then send them to the Hopkinton High School Diversity Club, we would love to have them. And somehow there will be something put together to really you know, kind of advocate for and illustrate um, the willingness of, in Hopkinton to promote social justice. So we're really excited about it. It's an amazing event that has just come about really organically. That sounds fantastic. Now, will they be able to um, find the information on your website, on the school's uh, I believe, website? I believe it's on the school's website. Um, and I think that they should look for the Hopkinton High School Diversity Club. I think that it's also on Facebook. And okay. I know that um, we have pushed out a lot of email as well. Okay, uh, we as eHop can also uh, put the link on our website. Great. We can update that, yeah. uh, but that sounds amazing. Um, so I wanna check in with Amanda. Do you think there's anything that we have to discuss further? In this very I think I, this is the easiest interview I've ever had. <laughs> I think it's great to have uh, our rock stars with us and uh, everything has been well covered. So I think we're good. I just wanna take this time to thank you guys so much um, I encourage people to watch this video, watch all four. Um, just some reminders about town meeting. Um, you can show up as early as 8.30 in the morning to get checked in. Um, the meeting will start at 9.30 with a quorum of 80 people, that's 8-0. Um, once you're there, get comfortable, because once you're in your seat, they, they would really like you to stay in your seat. Um, uh, besides being able to get up and talk into the mic, 
uh, are going to use the restroom. They're still figuring out the restroom situation, but um, you're really going to be in your seats. And this is the first town meeting where you can bring snacks. So that's encouraging. Um, and the meeting will continue until all articles are voted on. Um, so educate yourself ahead of time. Uh, reach out to the town officials with your questions. Uh, again, thank you guys for joining this segment of EHOP's Know Your Vote. And thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh and Susan Rothmick and Amanda Fargiano uh, for your valuable time. And as always, thank you to HCAM for your constant support and partnership with EHOP in producing this show. Uh, we do have three other segments. We met with um, the town clerk and the town moderator this morning. We're also meeting with the select board, town manager, planning board, CPC. Um, so there's a lot of information, but we're hoping to, to tighten it up and get it out there in short segments. Um, so this is a great way to educate yourself on the articles and allows you to reach out to the proper resources. We will see you all on September 12th at the high school. Again, check-in starts at 8.30 and the meeting starts at 9.30. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you.